So, so thank you for everybody uh, to come into uh, Privacy Talk. Uh, maybe this is the last time in this year. I'm so honored to invite Marie Elta from Paris. So she's uh, working on the many, many of the very important topic in our society that she is in, a, in UNESCO, director of uh, many of the digital transformation. So uh, Marie Elza, thank you for coming to this interview today. Uh, thank you. The honor and pleasure is all mine. So, you know, uh, uh, let me say, Tomorigato gozaimashita. <laughs> thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to share her profile. Uh, Dr. Marielta Oliveira is the UNESCO Director for Digital Inclusion Policies and Transformation in the Communication and Information Sector from February 2021 until November 2022. She was Director for Partnership and Operational Program Monitoring in the same UNESCO sector. From 2015, to 2020, she was director of UNESCO Beijing, covering the five East Asian countries. Previously, she was the global results manager, data scientist for UNDP, where she also held position as country manager for portfolio of Latin American countries from 2001 to 2015. Previous positions also include system engineer at the U.S. Army Construction Engineering Research Lab, USA Corp of Engineers, um, U.S. Uh, 1987 to 1991, where she was responsible for AI systems development, senior consultant at Fundaco Dom Cavallari, Brazil, 1995 to 1999, and Director of Executive Education at ITMEC Business School uh, from 2000 to 2001. Dr. Orbilera holds a Master of Science in Finance, 1990, and a PhD in Business Administration, 1995, from the University of Illinois at Auburn Campaign Champagne USA. So it's a very pleasure to have a call this moment. Thank you very much. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you. Um, so I'm quite so delighted to start the conversation about the interview. Um, at the beginning, I'm a very interested in your activity because uh, you concern the many of the international affair uh, all over the world. So could you tell us why you started uh, your own history and why you decided involved in this space? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as you presented me, you know, you probably saw that uh, I have a very <clears throat> different background than most um, people expect from a United Nations uh, staff, you know, uh, usually People think that we are uh, all development uh, uh, um, uh, people or we are working on, on uh, uh, international relations, that kind of background. However, I come from the private sector with a master's in finance uh, and a PhD in business and had long experience doing that, uh, working for uh, governments in Brazil uh, as well as in the U.S. Um, and uh, the, the what really t drove me to the United Nations was the mandate, you know, and, and particularly the idea that you can really help people, you know, uh, ensure that they have a high quality of life, contribute to improving the life conditions for, for people. And that's that's a passion that I had, that's a, a, an objective that I had, that um, I gained some experience in the private sector, in government, and even, even in academia as a, as a as a, a head of a, of a business uh, school, that I then found that I could apply, you know, to help improve people's lives in the UN system as well. And the fact that I have a, I had a unique background helped me very much uh, to, to address some um, issues that um, 
um, were not exactly being addressed as, as much, you know, uh, when I joined the UN. That was in, in 2001, you know, so many, many years ago, to actually 22 years ago to be exact. Um, and, um, you know, my, at the time, uh, one of the first projects that I started working with was modernization of Brazilian states, the fiscal modernization of Brazilian states, helping to modernize the tax collection systems because there was quite a lot of evasion, quite a lot of uncollected taxes. And if you don't have collect taxes, you really don't have the public resources to offer education, health, justice, and all the public services that people need. You know, so uh, that was one of the of the uh, uh, ways that I started to contribute. And I remember um, being uh, when I left that post to go to New York um, to, you know, because I started in Brazil and then moved to New York City uh, at uh, the headquarters of the United Nations Development Program. Um, I, I was driven around by a secretary of state of finance to show me, do you see that hospital? Do you see that road? Do you see that school? They were built with the improvements that uh, we had in the tax collection system, because and we are now able to offer, you know, millions more students uh, a better education and so on. And that was really moving, and that uh, you know fulfilled a dream for me to be able to help, uh, as in many ways. And um, when I went to New York, and then you know, to UNDP and then now at UNESCO, who, which has a fantastic, incredible mandate uh, of, uh, you know, building peace through education, through science, through communications, through culture, uh, is, is um, you know, it's been a lifelong dream for me, you know, so thank you for the question, you know, it, it brought many good memories for me, you know, so. Yeah, that's, that's so impressive. So I'm also the very, very curious. So you chose your own career as a finance. So is there any reason why the finance is quite an interesting part with you? Well, um, finance was a was an interesting issue for me uh, uh, because actually um, it required at the time um, a lot of uh, very strong quantitative skills and programming skills. And I had those. Um, so it was a, a matter of um, kind of matching you know, the skill set I had with the interests I had, I was interested in, in, in what um, different systems, you know, uh, uh, economic systems, how they could, uh, uh, how they impacted society um, and influencing those systems. So making, you know, doing research on how uh, financial management, uh, you know, and, and macro finance would affect uh, uh, social economic uh, goals for a country was something that was interesting to me. Um, so that's why I moved in there uh, into that field and got a master's in there. But then, you know, I realized that I needed deeper skills, you know, uh, understanding the social, you know, and psychological, social psychology side of, uh, of uh, that. So that's why I went to a PhD in business, which had a big component in cognitive science as well, you know, so it was half a, a PhD in business, half in cognitive science. Uh, and then I fell in love with the idea of, uh, of um, you know, of artificial intelligence systems and uh, and started programming those. Um, so that's the skill set that I developed naturally, progressively, I think. Um, and that's why I ended up being invited to do some programming, you know, software engineering for the Army Corps of Engineers, where I exercised that. Um, and then I returned to Brazil as a consultant, um, working in the private sector, um, but really wanted to continue looking at so social implications, not just uh, market implications. I wanted to contribute to society, not to, to the profits of a company. And then, you know, had the opportunity to do that uh, uh, through the UN. When the opportunity came, I really jumped you know, at that and... Uh, never regretted it. It was the best thing I've ever done, you know, so you don't earn as much, you know, uh, um, at the UN. It's not, you know, it's not the salary of a consultant in artificial intelligence in the private sector, of course, but it's the, so, so much more satisfying, you know, so I'm very happy that I made the move. Yeah, that's a very unique career um, since the, you change the position, but you combine it for the uh, more practical way that's been a 
very uh, good reference uh, for the listeners the how they brought the skills, experiences, then enhancing the uh, level of the achievement, uh, the your skills. So yeah, thank you for sharing. That's been a very um, good experiences. Um, so I think uh, now you uh, work at the uh, UNESCO. I think the UNESCO is, uh, there is a many project they organizing. So could you tell us the, your missions at the UNESCO, wh whether you are working on this moment? Okay, well, UNESCO, like I said, is, is, is an incredible organization. You know, the objective of UNESCO, the, the mandate, the key uh, raison d'etre, you know, how they say in French, the, the reason to exist of UNESCO is to build peace in the minds of men and women. That's uh, the first thing that comes up in our in the UNESCO constitution. And we do that by you know, promoting the free flow of ideas um, by word and image, uh, the free flow of good ideas, you know, and that's the good ideas free, you know, flow through education, through culture, to science exchanges and, and so, and to communication and information. Uh, in UNESCO, I, I have a very specific role. I'm a, as you mentioned in the beginning, I'm the director in the communications and information sector that deals with uh, digital transformation, digital inclusion, digital policies. That um, And the communication and information sector of UNESCO um, is the one that, uh, that uh, really promotes uh, the rights to freedom of expression and access to information in all forms, inclu you know, as well as privacy, and supports countries in building you know, human rights-based digital transformation. Because all countries are passing through uh, this, this technological, you know, huge technological transformation that is impacting everyone. Uh, but, uh, but this technological transformation does not include everybody. You know, uh, so you know, there, there are divides that happen, you know, tremendous divides. And, and there are two types of divides, essentially. One of them is about connectivity. Not everybody is connected. Um, to the internet, and even people who are connected are not necessarily connected, have meaningful access to information. They may lack the devices, they may lack affordable data packages, they may lack, you know, um, the ability to express themselves in their own languages on, on, on digital platforms, not all of them. You know, there, there are 7,061 languages in the world, and only about 200 and some in the, on the internet, you know, so people cannot really even have an email with their own name in their own language uh, uh, on the internet. So one of the things that we do is to help uh, meaningful access to information, to help countries, to help digital platforms, to help individuals to have real meaningful access to information, to help governments develop the appropriate policies for that. And the other, <coughs> sorry, the other digital divide that exists is about capacities and uh, <clears throat> and capacities are capacities of countries for example you know to actually build the, the and implement and enforce the right policies the right regulation uh, to enable people to have free expression to have access to information online and offline um, as well as capacities of individuals and institutions, you know, like, um, you know, you, you live in a country that is highly technologically, you know, uh, savvy and capable, but that's not true of all countries in the world. You know, in most countries, you know, people don't really have the capacity to access the internet, you know, because of connectivity, but also because they lack the skills, they lack the understanding, they lack the knowledge for that. And institutions, even institutions that are actually like ministries of uh, IT, need help in, in this highly uh, fast changing technological environment to actually enact the policies, enact the, the, the programs, you know, carry out the programs that enable people, you know, their citizens, the people in their countries to really, you know, enjoy these rights. Because, and these rights are extraordinarily necessary because nowadays, you know, people live, you know, essentially online, uh, you know, lives online as much as they live offline. You know, uh, in many places, uh, digital learning has become the norm. Uh, uh, digital access to justice requires you to have, 
you know, a, a computer, um, digital health has become you know, enabling people from, from places that don't have really good health systems locally to actually have uh, access to some types of health and so on and so forth. So, you know, jobs online and so on. So, you know, it's, it's really important that uh, people have the full capacity to really derive social economic value from being online not just being online, you know, for the sake of it, but really that they can be online to learn, to engage with other people, to de de enjoy their rights, you know, to public services that they are, you know, that they should be enjoying and so on. So that's why it's so important, uh, the area of communication and information um, in, in, of UNESCO in contributing to building these capacities in countries in individuals and in institutions so that everybody can have their rights to access to information and freedom of expression and privacy enjoyed, you know, so. Yeah, that's very amazing work. Um, I think that human rights is um, very important um, to distribute it to the internet to all, then accessing on the internet. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's very primary actions uh, for especially for a uh, developing country, a developed country to made it to work for uh, those kind of res responsibilities. And I think uh, AI artificial intelligence is uh, the our future, uh, especially for the digital societies because AI will support our societies uh, work and life. Uh, but I think that AI has some of the important aspects, such as how the AI decided any decisions, and also how this AI will determine our life. Uh, in this case, I think uh, ethical approach, ethical decision is uh, very significant uh, for most stakeholders. So could you tell us the, the UNESCO, how you work on AI and ethics? Then, what is the important point of this issue? Hmm. Now, thank you for the question. And you're absolutely right. And I know today, artificial intelligence does play a role in billions of people's lives. You know, all of us, you know, in 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 one way or another, are affected by artificial intelligence. Uh, sometimes we don't even know that, uh, but it has really profound consequences in how it transforms our lives and our societies. It can do like amazing things, like you know, pro customizing uh, support to education for millions of students at, at the same time, you know, provide new jobs or help us tackle global challenges such as climate change or COVID pandemic. But it also has, you know, big risks. It generates big risks such as the possibility of deepening existing inequalities that exist between and within countries. For example, the, you know, of course, there are only a few countries in the world that are actually generating advanced AI technologies. Most of other countries are actually being, you know, left behind in that sense. They don't have the capacities for that. So they become users of other countries' technologies. And that makes it even higher inequality between countries. And within countries, we know, of course, that uh, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, vulnerable members of, of society are not well represented in data sets that feed into these systems. Therefore, uh, they don't really uh, take into account their, their needs. You know, so uh, minorities, you know, women, um, they, they tend to be, you know, underrepresented uh, at the, all the steps of, uh, of producing uh, and using and even disposing of, uh, of uh, artificial intelligence systems. And they also contribute to spreading misinformation and disinformation at scale. You know, we, we're looking at uh, chat DPT now, you know, uh, 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 and how that system can actually generate incredible amounts of misinformation. We know that uh, some of those deep fakes out there are generated with the help of artificial intelligence and so on. So it has downsides. And we need to address those, those downsides. So at the same time that we enable and promote the potential that AI has to, uh, to help society, to contribute to prosperity, to peace, uh, to development in general. You know, so um, in, in November 2021, 
um, the 193 member states of UNESCO adopted a recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence, and they actually adopted it by acclamation because it was the very first global standard setting instrument on artificial intelligence ethics. Uh, there are 170 other you know, instruments, but none of them is actually global. This is the only one. And it's, it's important that we have global norms that we can actually share because AI reaches out globally. You know, so we need to have uh, ways of protecting and promoting human rights and human dignity you know, at scale, just like artificial intelligence works at scale. And, and that's why the ethics uh, recommendation of UNESCO is such a uh, guiding compass and became a global normative framework that uh, helps us strengthen the rule of law in the digital world. And it was produced uh, with a deep global consultation that involved experts, civil society, tech companies, and of course, member states, all stakeholders, uh, setting principles uh, that include some new principles such as proportionality, but also um, defining uh, policies that we need to follow in order to really uh, um, um, extract you know, uh, you know, the, the potential of AI while addressing all the risks. Um, so policies in the areas of education, in culture, in communications and information, in many areas, including in data protection, uh, but also uh, giving us two instruments that are very important. Uh, one instrument is, you know, is an as readiness assessment uh, as artificial intelligence, you know, um, ethics, you know, uh, readiness assessment to, to understand, you know, that countries can take to understand whether they are ready, you know, to really deploy, develop and deploy uh, ethical artificial intelligence that is in line with human rights frameworks. And the other instrument is the impact assessment that actually before you, you deploy a system, you know, looks at who could possibly be harmed and how do we mitigate those risks and what are the potential upsides, you know, uh, what are and how we can maximize the, the positive impact. So um, it, it's, it's not just principles, you know, it's really important to say it's a very practical instrument that, um, that uh, goes beyond uh, uh, looking at principles for the development of artificial intelligence, but actually, you know, uh, that looks at all life cycle of artificial intelligence systems from development all the way to disposal and, you know, and, and set standards for how we can have those systems be positive, you know, to, hum to human dignity, to human rights, to human life. Yeah, thank you. I think the UNESCO approach is very diverse, if I can. Diversification, it's a very helpful uh, for some of the minority participants in a different jurisdictions uh, because it's not easy uh, for one single country uh, just decided of those kind of the principle. But I think the UNESCO, that kind of the organization is very helpful to support uh, the uh, created of the more universal framework uh, to join of the different perspective. So I think the work is very important to support those kind of the inclusions. So the, the next topic is also very primary actions, maybe in UNESCO. I think the freedom expression is the fundamental rights for all of us. Uh, those uh, constitutional uh, importance has been discussed uh, in the time of the centuries ago, but this moment is becoming on the internet. So we posted many of the contents on the internet for freedom, but actually uh, it's sometimes it's intrusive, the problems of the privacy, the data protections. So could you, could you tell us an idea uh, uh, what is needed for the freedom of expression and privacy uh, to protect the human rights? Now you're, you're absolutely right. And this is a very important question. So thank you for that, uh, Kohei. Um, privacy is actually a really fundamental human right. is is recognized uh, uh, in Article 12 of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, in Article 17 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, 
and in a lot of other international and regional uh, treaties. Um, it, it really, you know, it's, is the cornerstone of human dignity and other key values such as freedom of association and freedom of expression. So uh, you, you can really freely express yourself if you are afraid, you know, for, you know, of uh, exposing yourself, you know, in some ways, you know, uh, that you're going to be surveilled, that you're going to be per persecuted for your expression and so on. So nowadays, you know, uh, most countries in the world, you know, uh, they really recognize that the right to privacy exists and, and even explicitly recognized it in their constitution. Um, and uh, many of these laws are actually based on, uh, on, on um, how the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development and the Council of Europe have developed laws such as that. But, um, you know, the problem is that um, perhaps, you know, uh, one of the most difficult rights to, to define is privacy, you know, uh, the right uh, uh, of privacy. Because these definitions vary widely, uh, depending on context, depending on environment, and so on, and uh, and have becoming even more important now. Like you rightfully mentioned, that uh, we are uh, in the digital world. You know, the, the increasing sophistication of uh, uh, information and communication technologies and their capacity to collect, to analyze, to disseminate information on people has really created a sense of urgency for us, you know, in order to, to demand effective legislation in this area. You know? So digital transformation is, is really a key reason why in many countries, these concepts of uh, freedom of expression, access to information and privacy have been changing so much. And the concept of, uh, you know, digital transformation actually being fused with these issues of data protection, particularly because new technologies uh, they are they feed on data, you know. They essentially uh, exist because there is a massive amount of data, what we call big data, um, and that big data is actually collected in many ways. In you know, in 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 many ways that actually are invasive to privacy um, and include personal information that reveals details about people that, that uh, legally should be kept privacy. So, you know, digital technologies, uh, the right to privacy is actually become one of the most important, most demanded human rights uh, and, and, and biggest issues of our time. But people are concerned about surveillance technologies, to include white tapping, video monitoring, biometrics, personal ID systems, data mining, and all that comes with that. Um, and uh, the, the capacity of these systems to really uh, invade you know, uh, uh, people's lives uh, and create controls of human activity. Um, and, and the thing is that in many countries, the laws have really not kept up with the technology and leave tremendous gaps in the protections that exist. So what UNESCO does uh, is to support, you know, uh, countries in developing adequate uh, um, regulatory frameworks and building their capacities for that. Uh, and uh, and to look at uh, how, uh, you know, to protect these rights uh, in digital worlds. You know, we actually also advocate for open data, but uh, within a human rights framework, because open data can help us, you know, solve a lot of, a lot of problems. You know, you, as you remember, uh, probably in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, scientists were able to sequence, uh, you know, the DNA, uh, uh, the genome of the, uh, of the COVID virus very fast, exactly because they shared data across countries and, you know, that it speeds up the process of finding a solution, you know. Uh, but, uh, but for that, you really need to also have the protections of personal data and the protections of data and privacy in general so that we can build trust and confidence in society so that people can really, you know, share what is, you know, what can help us uh, uh, develop solutions without the fear that they will be manipulated, controlled, invaded by these systems. You know? So it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a really important uh, area of, of, the, of UNESCO's work. And uh, we, we do quite a lot in that regard, you know, including uh, there is a, a new framework that we've developed recently and a competency framework for civil servants. Um, it's a, uh, an artificial intelligence and, the, and digital transformation competency framework um, that uh, 
that really uh, one of the key areas is exactly on data, to supporting uh, the management um, of data from, you know, the design of data frames, you know, all the way to collection, you know, analysis, et cetera. Um, but uh, with, you know, for, for within a human rights perspective, you know, making sure that uh, data privacy and protection are a key part of how systems are developed. So we are helping countries to build those capacities at the same time, we're helping people uh, to, uh, to protect themselves. We also monitor globally uh, the uh, number of countries that have information loss uh, and how, how effectively they monitor those information laws and implement those information laws because having a law is not enough. You actually have to have a budget behind that law, you know, uh, um, you know civil servants that are capable of enforcing and monitoring and so on. So we help with that, you know, all over the world, and we have, you know, it's an essential part of the work we do. Thank you. I think that these days, a lot of questions about the uh, freedom of expression and privacy, there's some of the concerns related to the journalistic, uh, because of the journalist, it's been uh, restricted on privacy, it's not easy for them to express themselves. So is there any solutions that protect uh, the freedom of expression? Of course, the privacy is a uh, very important solutions uh, to protect the idea, but do you have any other options for them to um, distribute it, the important uh, expressions by the any um, activities, so any actors um, to stream in their own contents? Uh, you, you touched on an incredibly important topic, you know, media. And uh, because we live in a world of information online, um, we need to make sure that uh, when people access information, they're actually accessing reliable information. Because a lot of it is what people wrongly call fake news, you know, but it's a misinformation or disinformation um, and even hate speech and radicalization, you know, attempts in, in cyberspace and so on. Uh, a lot of uh, cyber scams and cybersecurity issues and so on. And people need to learn how to protect themselves, you know, so we, we do have a curriculum um, for ministries of education that we work with the ministries of education in, in many, many different countries in order for them to embed as a curriculum on media and information literacy to help people, you know, students as well as teachers, of course, to acquire these skills to protect themselves. But that's not enough. Uh, we actually need all kinds to support the different types of, uh, of uh, um, information providers that provide reliable information. And of course, media is one of the critical ones. Uh, but uh, but the media is also being threatened uh, in, because in many different ways. First, uh, we do research on, uh, on uh, the safety of journalists. And we have appalling, appalling statistics, like 73% of all women journalists are threatened and harassed online. Out of those, 20% actually end up attacked attacked physically in real life. So literally one in seven women journalists actually get attacked because of being, a, just because they're doing their job. And that's also, you know, you know even worse for what we call the intersectional uh, um, situations when there are black women or there are Latino women or, or other minorities, you know, uh, um, and of course, that happens happens with men as well, you know. So in, in less of a proportion, but it happens. Um, so it's it's protection of the safety of journalists, you know. Promoting the safety of journalists is is one of the key areas of work of UNESCO. Uh, supporting the development of media, you know, so that we have pluralistic, inclusive, you know, uh, uh, media, and reliable information being produced by media is a tremendous, uh, uh, of tremendous importance for us. We have a section, uh, one of our teams in the communications and information sector that works exactly on that, 
on the freedom of expression and safety of journalists. So they do quite a lot of things. They support the development of, uh, of uh, regulatory frameworks uh, that, that protect uh, safety of journalists. They lead, you know, uh, the team leads the, the uh, United Nations plan of action on the safety of journalists that this year completes uh, 10 years, you know, so we are very happy to see that. We celebrate every year uh, the World Press Freedom Day. Uh, we, we do a lot of different things, like for example, um, in conflict uh, settings, we even go there to distribute uh, 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 press uh, vests that are bulletproof and help to protect this, the lives of journalists. And we track and denounce and keep a, a database of all journalists that have been killed. And it's, it, it's around the world. And it's a terrible, terrible statistic. Every five days or so, another journalist dies. You know, and, and, and he or she doesn't die. You know, we're not talking about those who die of old age or an accident or something. We're ta talking about those who are killed because they were exerting their profession, exercising their profession. So it's, um, you know, and then we denounce that and we, you know, keep monitoring uh, the prosecution of such, you know, crimes against journalists. We have an actual day uh, uh, that we call the the, uh, the International Day uh, for Ending Crimes Against Journalists that uh, we actually celebrate and use to raise awareness of, uh, of these issues around the world. And, uh, you know, so... This is this is a, a, a big and very sad, terrible part of our job um, that we hope we should, you know, one day we would no longer have to do, you know. Uh, uh, but uh, but it's it has everything to do with uh, these issues of privacy. Quite a lot of these journalists are subject to tremendous surveillance, you know, surveillance, including with, uh, you know, spyware being embedded in their in their. Uh, um, communications devices, you know, to monitor them, to track them. Um, that's how they end up being exposed and 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 uh, beaten up and you know and and jailed and killed. You know, sometimes you know it's a uh, uh, so there's the privacy issues, there's expression issues. A lot of women journalists, because they are harassed, they end up leaving the profession. You know, so you lose you know important voices as well. You know, so. Um, protecting, you know, and promoting freedom of expression through, you know, support to media is incredibly important to democracy, you know, to social cohesion, to expression, and to actually, you know, enable us to have reliable information on which to make decisions as a society, you know, as media provides to us, you know, so. Yeah, thank you for sharing the great insight. I think it's a very important to democratic decisions uh, we are not able to make sure that the uh, without any information from the journalistic, uh, the freedom expression is uh, very important to make an adjustment properly um, to uh, maintain all the democratic actions. So yeah, we should uh, discuss in the what kind of solution we can provide it uh, on the internet, digital society. Uh, I think the UNESCO has variety of the initiative at this moment, then the next year, 2023, is also the very important year for you. Um, yeah. On the UNESCO website, uh, you released the model of regulatory framework. Uh, could you share us what um, does this mean of the framework? Then what are you planning on the strategic uh, 2023 in the UNESCO? No, thank you very much. You know, you, what you mentioned is that uh, uh, next year, on the 21st to 23rd of February 2023, UNESCO is actually convening the uh, in our headquarters in Paris, a global conference on Internet for Trust. And, uh, you know, it, this, this has become incredibly important because, you know, even though digital platforms are fantastic tools, you know, when, when it comes to people communicating and learning and uh, engaging and keeping in touch with each other, they also have been used to spread misinformation and disinformation, hate speech, uh, conspiracy theories, and all kinds of different harmful content um, that really affect very 
negatively human rights and dignity, democracy, social cohesion. You know, uh, this, this disinformation and misinformation actually kill. You know, we know that, you know, uh, anti-vax movements, climate denialism, those, those are killing people. Electoral, you know, uh, disinformation is changing political systems, you know, tremendously. So what we need to do is, is address this, this, this tremendous harm that, uh, that exists and build an internet that is actually for trust, that people have, the, that can trust the information they find. So the idea, you know, the, the, the problem is actually because current regulatory systems have not really been set up to address these issues, you know. So we, we decided to tackle this problem as, as UNESCO has a mandate to protect the freedom of expression, access to information, and to support human rights-based digital transformation. So um, we actually uh, are convening this global conference to implement this mandate, bringing together ministers, regulators, judicial actors, private sector, UN entities, academia, all kinds of different organizations with big tech companies and so on, so that we can together discuss how do we tackle these issues? How do we shape digital platforms through regulation, to co-regulation, self-regulation, the different types of mechanisms that really can support freedom of expression and while eliminating this, this, this scourge of misinformation and disinformation, hate speech, and so on. Um, and of course, um, that, that uh, is, is important because many countries have yet to develop regulatory frameworks to address these issues. Others, um, some approaches that have you know, uh, developed uh, regulation, but uh, they are not really aligned with international human rights standards and, and have actually ended up suppressing freedom of expression or even being ineffective in dealing with this kind of content. And, uh, and several countries have good regulation, but, not, but very limited capacity actually uh, in, to enforce uh, uh, and monitor you know, uh, the results of their regulation. So what we're doing is bringing together a multi stakeholder community that really can discuss and arrive at a guidance on how to address these kinds of harmful you know, uh, 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 content on the internet so that really we can have you know, a freedom of expression, access to information, and trust you know, in digital ecosystems. Yeah, it's uh, very important to cooperate it together with the different background, the different sectors. Uh, to come to the coordinated of the uh, more universal principles um, to um, more peaceful actions. So it's it's going to be a very significant role uh, with you and your team to work on this hard work. Um, so lastly, uh, could you share any message for listeners? I think uh, your work is very important uh, to include the human rights. Uh, for all of the actions. So it's a very important message uh, from you. Now, thank you very much. You know, uh, what I would say, you know, to, to everyone uh, is that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really important that we promote and protect human rights and dignity online, just as it's promoted and protected offline. They are the same. There is no space in which you know uh, uh, digital you know human rights do not apply so uh, you know every human activity whether or not it takes place in cyberspace or in a particular physical location you know we are all in, endowed with inalienable you know human rights and we should all be striving to protect them so um, um, you know, take a look at, uh, at uh, what UNESCO is doing, how you can contribute to that. Visit the UNESCO uh, website uh, and, uh, you know, contribute to, to this work, spread the idea that, uh, that we should all be working together to ensure that peace really happens through the free flow of ideas uh, by world and image, whether we're, those ideas exist on digital spaces or physical spaces. So, Thank you very much. And to the Japanese community, I just want to express tremendous appreciation. We work very closely together with Japan uh, in preserving and digitizing 
important archives, for example. It's one of the areas of work that we're incredibly uh, grateful to Japan for supporting. And, um, you know, we, we hope to see our Japanese stakeholders as uh, participating in the conference next year. Thank you. Thank you for the very warm message and thank you for your notice. So again, uh, Marielta, thank you for having this moment in uh, Christmas season. I hope you have a great times in Paris then uh, let's see it again soon. Thank you. Have a peaceful holiday and a restful holiday and a wonderful 2023. So I'll see you soon. Thank you, Kohei. Thank you. Bye.